We had to wait a while because of the rain, which moved the race to Monday, but it was worth the wait. We had a great race today with a great finish. Let's talk about the race we had at Michigan. Hello everyone, my name is Kyle aka Racing Boy Short and this is my channel where I talk NASCAR, NASCAR news and everything NASCAR. Per usual at Michigan International Speedway in the Irish Hills, seems like every time NASCAR goes to Michigan that rain affects it in some sort of way, whether that's pushing the race to Monday, even Tuesday at times, or just delaying the start of the event. Rain had an impact on the whole weekend as it affected practice. Teams got very, very limited practice. Ended up canceling qualifying for the event. So there was a decent amount of unknowns going into the race at Michigan. And then on Sunday, you had some rain affecting the start of the race. They ended up finally getting some laps in, but eventually they had to stop the event because of rain. And there's no there's no lights at Michigan International Speedway, so they only had very limited time to work with. So NASCAR decided to call it early, which I think was a great call on NASCAR's part to call it early and not keep on pushing it because there was no way they were going to get the full race in. And they moved it to Monday at at 11 a.m. I was about to say 8 a.m. because I'm here on the West Coast, but 11 a.m. on the East Coast. And we had some great racing. We saw a lot of passing. Tires actually made a huge difference throughout the event. We saw a lot of different strategies like Kyle Busch and Randall Burnett, I think, they probably had the best strategy of the race because it gave them track position. They were way off strategy. I feel like most of the race ended up working out for Kyle, getting a very rare top five on the year and led a good amount of laps as well. Won a stage too. First stage win on the year for Rowdy. But one thing about Michigan, the track is limited. It's I'm not going to compare it directly to Texas, but it has that sort of Texas element to it where the top side is pretty useless. There's still a lot more space to race at Michigan, but that very top lane, like at California, Auto Club, whatever you want to call it, Fontana, you saw a lot of drivers going all the way to the top of the racetrack and use the high line. You've even seen that at Michigan in the past, but ever since they repaved it, they repaved it like, I think around a decade ago, that high line has been pretty useless. But with the lanes that they had, they used it to their to the max. You did even see some cars all the way up at the top, but they did not have any speed all the way up the top. On those restarts, you saw four wide, three wide. You saw a bunch of just crazy racing throughout the day. You saw a couple of gnarly incidents. This probably is a good segue into those incidents. Those We had a couple of gnarly incidents throughout the day, but there's two... Very notable incidents. We'll talk about the, I guess, the less insane of the two. But the fact that this wreck took out so many cars stood out. And, of course, the driver starting it also makes it stand out as well. A lot of you saw it. Kyle Larson self-spinning in turns three and four, you see here. And ends up taking out a lot of good race cars. Busher got involved. Logano, who already had... Some issues, Christopher Bell. I'd say the most notably here is Bubba Wallace, who was extremely fast throughout the day. It seemed like he might have had the best car out of the bunch. Unfortunately, got taken out in this incident, and his car was not the same afterwards. A very big incident, but the, I think the main talking point is here, and I'm I'm gonna say this very uh, like for I'm gonna say this first. I'm gonna say this straight up to start off with. So people don't come at me in the comments because I know they will. I've, I've said it on my channel before. I think Kyle Larson's a fantastic race race car driver. I consider him to be better than Max Verstappen, but that's also because I don't know what else Max Verstappen can really race. I've seen him race open wheel. That That's really it. I've, I don't think I've ever... I personally, I personally have never seen him race anything other than open wheel or iRacing. Kyle Larson is an extremely talented race car driver, 
But that being said, how many times is he going to do this? He makes a lot of... There's no driver in the Cup Series that makes... Well, maybe not, let's not go that far. I wouldn't. I was about to say he. There's no driver that makes more mistakes than than Larson. But no, you, you got Corey LaJoy, you got Carson Osavar in there as well. But out of the big name guys, out of the big name guys, there's no driver that makes more mistakes and more self spins than than Kyle Larson. I think Kyle Busch has definitely had some struggles, but I think a lot of those aren't necessarily his own doing. Of course, you had the Brickyard, which was his own doing. But not everything's his own doing. I feel like almost any time Larson has an issue, it's something that Larson himself has done. And like I said, I think Larson's a fantastic race car driver. I think he's the best race car driver in the world. But sometimes he's too good for his own good, I guess you could say. He pushes it just a little bit too hard at times. You see Christopher Bell do that quite a bit as well. And Christopher Bell, I consider to be one of the most talented drivers in the Cup Series, maybe even the world as well. Haven't really seen him on dirt as well because Coach Gibbs doesn't let him. So pretty much what I'm getting at here, Kyle Larson, he just needs to clean up when it comes to, he just pushes it a little bit too hard at times. And I, I feel like it's not even usually at the end of these races. I remember he did it at, I think it was a Texas last year when he self-spun underneath Bubba Wallace. And I think that was near the end of the race. But most of these mistakes, I feel like, are coming mid-race, early on. Just pushing it a little bit too hard and just self-spins or gets himself into the wall. I, I just think he needs to minimize those mistakes. And I think he's been pretty good as of late. But th- this is just another chapter into... Larson essentially just making these mistakes and it's it's always it always stands out because Kyle Larson is so talented all right now let's talk about this crazy crazy incident we had here with Corey LaJoy it's been a very tough year for Corey LaJoy it's probably been the toughest year of his career it's not like it's been the worst season he's ever had or anything like that just coming into this year he had all these expectations, I'd say, not necessarily expected to go out there and win a bunch of races or something, but I think a couple people, including myself, were expecting him to at least compete for one of those playoff spots, at least get into the top 20 in points, and he, he struggled a lot this season. Then, of course, not too long ago, it was announced that he's no longer going to be part of Spire Motorsports, so his career is kind of up in the air. We don't know what his next step is. Does he stay in the Cup Series, Trucks, Xfinity, who knows? But then just to have this crazy incident, one of the worst incidents we've had all season, one of the few flips I've seen in this next-gen car. We haven't seen this car flip a bunch. We've seen it flip a couple of times, but I feel like any time... It has flipped. It's been it's been pretty gnarly. It's been a pretty crazy, scary wreck. And this was one of them. Luckily, that roof is extremely strong. We've seen these next-gen cars flip over a couple of times. Like I've said, Harrison Burton or the, and Ryan Priest and Christopher, Chris Buescher. I was about to say Christopher Buescher. Christopher Buescher. The, those, those guys and their flips didn't really damage the roof of the car too much. And it was the same here and Corey LaJoy went on a ride was sliding on the roof of that car like it was a sled in a snowstorm right when he hits the grass as these cars are well all all cars are but I feel like especially these cars are very reactive to the grass and just does a bunch of tumbles and lands on its wheels LaJoy sounds like he's okay looks like he's okay maybe he has a couple of bruises or something like that It really shows how safe these cars are. And I see some people really complaining about the flyover. And I agree. I don't really want to see that. But at the same time, I think I think Denny Hamlin said, I I don't know exactly what he said. I think I read something. Maybe it wasn't Hamlin. There's not too much to really prevent this. They can slow down the cars. They can I think what what I read was you can remove the whole underbody and it's just 
It's things that us, the fans, and or NASCAR want to do or is even possible to do. So it's, it is what it is, I'd say. Because like I said, we haven't seen too many flips in this car and i'd say this was the this was probably one of the worst i'd say the priest one was definitely the worst flip we've seen but like i said we've seen very minimal flips in this car i don't think it's something to react too much about but i think everybody's entitled to their opinion so let me know if you feel different about that like i said i don't really want to see a car flip it's not like oh i want to see a car flip out there today but I, I, I've watched NASCAR my whole life. It's just kind of part of it when you're watching these high-speed tracks like a Daytona, Talladega, Michigan, even Atlanta at this point. I could see maybe a flip there as well because of how fast it is there as well. That's just kind of how it is with these high-speed tracks, and that's how it's always been. It was way worse back in the 80s. Those cars would, those would fly to the moon. Those are pretty much planes. These cars are, I'd say, that they, they don't produce the greatest racing. And it seems like they've worked out most of the kinks when it comes to that first season. We had all the concussions and stuff with that first season. Unfortunately, it ended Kurt Busch's career, which is awful. But it seems like these cars are, are, are probably the safest cars we've had. I don't want to... Let me knock on... Let me knock on wood. I don't want to speak too soon, obviously, but these, these cars are pretty safe. They don't produce the greatest racing, but they produce great safety. All right, let's get down to the end of this race. And we had a pretty entertaining finish to this race. There was multiple drivers really here at the end of this event that really showed like they had a decent shot at the victory. You had Kyle Busch. You had Chase Elliott. You had William Byron up here as well. But I'd say the most notable of the bunch, and that was Tyler Reddick. Tyler Reddick was one of the three best cars, I'd say, all day. I'm still not sure which one of the three was the best car. But the three best cars all day were Denny Hamlin. Unfortunately, Denny Hamlin self-spun and then damaged the underbody going across the grass earlier on in the event. Not too long after they resumed on Monday. And then, of course, I went over what happened with Bubba Wallace, his incident with Kyle Larson. Those two were very, very fast on the same level as Tyler Reddick, but they had their issues, and Reddick kept it clean all day. He stayed out of trouble. I'd say I'd say most likely he was the third quickest out of the three because he was lagging behind these drivers. Maybe that was a strategy call. I doubt it. But Reddick was fast all day long and really showed his speed at the end of this event, making passes, getting back up to the front, and it looked like he had the win locked up. And then we have a late caution with Martin Truex Jr. slamming the wall in turns three and four. I think I read something that Tyler Reddick was really upset, saying that Martin Truex Jr. only touched the wall and that shouldn't have been a caution. He hit the wall pretty hard. Um, I'm pretty iffy about it. The only reason, usually I would say no. Oh, that's not a caution. The only reason I'm here saying yes is because NASCAR calls that caution a lot. If a car goes flying into the wall like Truex did, like I said, Truex hit the wall pretty hard. He didn't just barely touch the wall like Reddick tried to make it seem. He hit the wall pretty hard. And for NASCAR to be consistent, them thinking probably he has a blown tire or something like that, they're going to throw the caution. So, I'm like I said, I'm kind of mixed about it. Personally, if it were me in the booth, I'm not throwing a caution for that. But NASCAR, to be consistent with their calls, they must call a caution for that. And it was a very reactionary caution, a very quick caution from the booth. Which ended up setting up a green-white checkered finish. A great restart on this first green-white checkered finish from William Byron, who actually decided to start on the inside of Tyler Reddick on the first row, had a great advantage going through one and two, but Reddick gets a huge run off of two, clears Byron going down the back straightaway, and maybe like 10, 15 cars back, probably just 10 cars back, Ross Chastain gets turned around on 
the back straightaway. Very unfortunate. Chastain was having a very good day. And of course, he's right near the bubble. A couple of the bubble boys had a lot of issues. I'm talking about Busher, Bubba, Ross, all had issues. Gibbs was probably the best out of the bunch. I ended up finishing third. So this would set up another green-white checkered. And when I was seeing this on TV, I'm really surprised I haven't seen more people talk about it. But when I was watching it on TV, I'm like, all right, Reddick's the leader. All right. And I know they go by scoring loops, but Reddick was the leader for around half of the back straightaway at this point. He took the lead off of turn two, had the nose off of two, and cleared him and had like almost a half car length on him by the time Chastain started spinning. And then the caution came out and they went back to the last scoring loop. I, I understand the scoring loops and I'm fine with that. It makes it easier for NASCAR. But if you're going to do scoring loops, especially on these bigger tracks, you got to put more scoring loops because what that tells me is that there's probably maybe like five or six. There's probably five or six scoring loops on Michigan. Is that That's what that's telling me, which is silly because Reddick had a huge advantage on the back straightaway, had the race lead, and should have had the advantage on the last restart. I feel like probably most people aren't talking about it because Reddick did end up winning the race. But still, if we're going to do scoring loops, and I do agree with scoring loops, the only reason why I agree with scoring loops is because then we're going to have 10 lap cautions instead of like five because they're going to use like the first two or three laps just to figure out the, the lineup. So I understand the scoring loops. But you have to, I'd say you have to have a certain minimum of scoring loops depending on the distance of track. Because, yeah, William Byron, if William Byron had a better restart, and we'll, we'll get to that actually, but they should just have, they should have more scoring loops on these tracks because that's kind of ridiculous. Because it probably screwed over a couple other drivers too. All right, now get to the last restart of the race. You have... The front row essentially flip-flopped. You had Byron on the inside for the first one. Now he's on the outside. And Redick has moved from the outside to the inside, switching positions from first to second. Byron gets an okay restart. Not a very good restart. While Redick gets a perfect restart and is right there on Byron's door going into the corner. And I think the ultimate thing that cost Byron here... Well, first of all, Redick had a better car and was a little bit quicker throughout the day. But I think the the big, big fault here for Byron was Brad Keselowski had some sort of engine issue. He, he said it in his post-race interview where his engine would just randomly shut off. And it looks like that's potentially what happened here on the final restart. You even see Kyle Busch comment on it on Twitter. But Byron not getting that push into turns one and two that I think he was hoping for and expecting, I think affected him throughout one and two enough to the point where Reddick was going to clear him. I think if he got that push, he might've been able to hang on to Reddick's quarter panel, but without that little nudge from Brad going into the corner, Reddick had it and he pulled away immediately. Reddick was just so quick. Ty Gibbs, he had a, he had a good run at the end. He was pretty quiet throughout the day, but he, he seemed like he had good speed. Like I said, he had a great finish getting third, much needed finish for him. It sets him up almost 40 points above the cut line. So overall, a very good race, a very entertaining race. I'd say air definitely played a factor, but not as much as we're used to. I'd say with most tracks, this car just tends to do a lot better on this sort of track. And that kind of leads off my final thoughts on the race. Those incidents were insane. Um, I'm happy that NASCAR has such safe cars at the moment. Tyler Reddick, he's been so close to winning so many races all year. Uh, he, it just feels like he can't close them out. And he's he's been great lately. I think he has a bunch of second places, a bunch of top fives as of late. And was able to finally get back into victory lane for the second time this season. Great race from him. Great race from both him and Bubba. 23-11 looked incredibly strong. I wish Bubba didn't have that damage. If Bubba didn't have that damage, I think there would have been a 
a good shot. We would have seen one, two for the Mickey D's cars. And then the bubble is, is awfully close. And I think the biggest story potentially coming out of this race is how close the bubble is. Currently, you have four drivers battling for the last three spots as we head in to Daytona. There's a very good chance we could get a wild card sort of winner, a driver locking up their spot and taking away one of those spots. But you have Ty Gibbs, like I said, 39 points to the good. You have Busher, 16 points to the good. And then you have Chastain and Bubba Wallace only separated by a single point for that last spot in the playoffs heading into Daytona and then Darlington, and then we start the playoffs after Darlington. Only two more races until the playoffs. And this is going to be an epic battle, especially since I personally think we are going to get a wild card winner in Daytona. You'll have to wait for my Daytona preview for that, but I have something cooking for that. But let me know down below. Give me your thoughts about the race at Michigan International Speedway. I'd say it's probably the best race we've had at Michigan ever since they repaved the racetrack. I, I don't know what your opinion would be, but that is my opinion. That's the best racing I've seen there in quite a while. It's great to see Reddick get the victory, and I'm glad LaJoy is okay after that incident. That was a very scary, insane incident we saw. Also, if you haven't already, I would appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel. I do multiple NASCAR videos throughout the week, but that'll do it for me. Thanks for watching. My name is Kyle, aka Racing Boy Short, saying peace.